Anyway, uh, we're supposed to be talking about um, uh, John Scotus Irgina, who is probably the height in terms of um, metaphysics and epistemology. Uh, he is a, a Platonist. He is a, a Christian follower of, of Plato, as, as am I to a great extent. And he is, as I've said before, probably Ireland's greatest metaphysician. Um, the first point I want to make about him is his uh, understanding of reality. At its most general, there are four divisions of nature. This is very general, and these four general things, going from the most, uh, the, the, the entity with the most being, or isness, to that with the least being, or isness. And you see that very typically in, in, in Plato, where it is the, the disembodied forms that have being most perfectly. They're not abstract. They are, in fact, highly concrete, just not material. They're not abstract concepts. They are actually spiritual entities. And this is part of the both the Platonic and the, the Neoplatonic um, movement uh, throughout European history. But the four divisions of nature are, first of all, the creator who is uncreated, and that is God himself. That's the highest element of being. Something that creates, but that something is itself uncreated. But then you have a creator who is in fact created, created by God, and those are the Platonic ideas. Those are um, spiritual entities only imperfectly manifest in our earthly material existence. So, for example, um, if we want to know what justice is, Merely looking at a series of just acts is insufficient. All of those just acts are just because they partake in something spiritual. They partake of something above themselves. They're just only because they are a part of justice. Justice, with a capital J, justice as such is not a physical thing. It is not a physical act. You could think of it imperfectly as a mathematical formula. A mathematical formula doesn't need to be a part of matter in order to be true. So this is this is what this is the nature of ideas. Now, I, Platonic ideas is something that I could and I have lectured on, you know, for years. But that's kind of the thumbnail view. But they create, not in the sense that they have actual volition, but they are the archetype of all objects and actions um, on earth. Then you have the third thing, the uh, created object that does not create. And that refers to objects, just simple objects that you come across in nature. They are created, but they, in, in, in fact, do not create anything beyond themselves. And then, the void. The void is that um, that does not create and is also uncreated. And that is the void. That is nothing. So that's the first element. There's this hierarchy of being from God through the forms to natural objects and relations, to the void, that which God built within. Now, within this division of nature, there, is, there, there are five modes of being. Um, there are spiritual realities that transcend our uh, faculties. And then, underneath that, there are the orders of created natures. Everything from uh, forms to angels to our own intellectual concepts, things along the lines of mathematical formulas and, and ideas, down to the things that those ideas are instantiated in, uh, objects 
and relations and our own actions. Objects in nature are the result of very explicit causes and that they contain in themselves further potential for development. And the ideas are things that exist in the intellect alone. They don't exist in it, but they can only be approached by the intellect. And then there are those who have come to the faith, the true knowledge of the spiritual world, and those are the redeemed. They are in their ascetic life, and of course, no doubt, Scotus Edigina saw this in Ireland, that they had, in many respects, gone beyond cause and effect. The point you have to remember here, that in this hierarchical mode of being, which is connected to the four divisions of nature, that which is above contains and negates that which is below. That which is above negates that which is below because that which is above gives the reason and purpose for that which is below. So, that which is above has more being, has more purpose than that which is below it and therefore that which is below it by comparison does not exist or exists only to a much, much lesser extent. That which is above is always that which is worth talking about, that which is worth understanding. All being, therefore, is this process of affirming something and then by situating it as a part of a larger structure, negating it. You negate it as an individual thing when you place it in its proper context as a part of this great hierarchy of, of being. Now the third issue is God himself. Scotus Edigina refers to God as the universal negation. He's a universal negation because our ordinary categories of thought and language, even ideally speaking, don't apply to God. And since our language and mental capacity cannot be applied to God, from the human point of view, God is in fact nothing. He's nothing in the sense that he cannot be approached uh, in normal discursive terms. He can only be approached in terms of grace. He can only be approached when he in fact, approaches us. And one of the ways that he approaches us is through creation. Now, Edogina is not a pantheist, but a lot of people have accused him in the past of being a pantheist. Because he says that creation is a divine self-manifestation. But of course, you know, there's more than one way that creation can be a divine manifestation. Creation can be a divine manifestation in the sense that creation is part of God himself, which um, Scotus does not hold to. But at the same time, it's more than just the relationship between an artist and the artist's creation. And this, of course, is part of the Logos doctrine that, that has come up on this broadcast and is central to the ancient Christian faith. The Logos is that presence of pure being, God himself, manifest in objects. That doesn't mean that objects have a part of God in them. It just means that it has a divine imprint. It has a divine DNA, so to speak, that's to be found within it. But Logos is the Greek word for word. The word word is very much misunderstood. Word, with a capital W, is a metaphysical entity. It is not just something that we say for the sake of communication. A word, any word that we may use to describe something, is in fact a community of ideas. Any word we use does not have a simple definition. 
It is a highly contextualized, situated, relational. It's a communal element. The word, the logos, as it's manifest in things, making them what they are and behave the way they are and function the way they are. Their DNA, so to speak. These are the primary causes of their existence and their relationships. And Scotus will go on to say that causality is in fact a manifestation of that which is immaterial. A cause, something that causes something else has always been a metaphysical problem because no one's ever seen a cause before. We've seen state X and then something happens and then there's state Y. But that's not the same thing as seeing a cause. You see, in fact, two different states. So, in a sense, God is imminent in creation through the Word. That is not the same thing as saying that the material world is part of God's person. That's a, those are two different things. The Word is the manifestation of God's mind. The manifestation of God's mind at any given moment, by definition, must in fact be God. And so, Scotus, Scotus Udagina, taking this basic Platonic idea, can't help but then posit the Trinity as a something that's absolutely natural and easily proven scientifically because the reflection of God must be God. That reflection, that manifestation, the mind of God, the thought of God is itself divine. It would have to be. It is that presence, the Logos, that took flesh as Christ, that exists in nature and forms the essence of objects and their relationships one with another. These effects, these relationships in nature are the Logos, in a sense, taking on matter relative to fallen humanity. What we see, we, we, we perceive things like, like forces, and we perceive heat, and all of these physical things. Physics, fairly advanced Greek physics, was, was, was well known in Ireland. Causes, cause and effect that is the world of fallen humanity. That is the world of determination. It is a world almost at the level of chaos and void. It is... Um, when, when, when an intellectual effect, when the, the form, the, the logos found in objects, when it creates, uh, when, it, when it's involved in cause and effect relationships, um, that is the nature of determinism, but that material determinism that exists because of our fallen state. In our fallen state, state away from grace, can only perceive and comprehend cause and effect, material determination. However, human freedom, therefore, remains a mystery. And Plato did really not, he didn't really have a theory of the will. Neither did Aristotle, because the concept of free volition wasn't well developed. It existed. Everyone knows it exists. Everyone knows that they make decisions, and they make decisions freely, at least some of the time. And that remains a mystery because it can't be necessarily reduced to natural cause and effect and can't be explained from the day-to-day -day cause and effect of the natural world. And that's kind of your step from your physical relationships in nature that is your step then to the world of immaterial things because the will and the ego, these are not reducible to material causes. We are talking about Orthodox Ireland in the thought of the Neoplatonic writer uh, John Scotus Udagina, who dies in 877 A.D., and is uh, very much part of the um, Orthodox monastic life in early medieval Ireland, where the Greek mind uh, was still very, very well known in the West. You didn't have this pretty much anywhere else 
in Western Europe, except in what we call insular Ireland, or the Ireland prior to the invasion of Henry II, and then the slow but sure colonization of Ireland by uh, the Norman kings of Great Britain. And we're talking in, in fairly um, ethereal terms about Erugina's connection to Plato and Neoplatonism. And, and I've said many times on this show that um, I became a Christian because I was a Platonist. And it's not an uncommon thing. And people like St. Basil went through that. Uh, Origen went through that. St. Augustine went through that. Uh, the men we're talking about today went through that. St. Athanasius went through that. A lot of people associated very closely with Greek thought and scholarship who can't help but see a prophecy, a precursor of the Christian message within Greek metaphysics. And uh, I was one of these people. And people like Ergina uh, also fall into this category. This is someone who studied the great Greek classics which had been preserved in the monasteries of Ireland and then sought a synthesis of the Neoplatonic vision along with the Christian gospel. And the gospel of John, especially the first chapter, makes it fairly easy to do. And there are metaphysical concepts in uh, the Gospels. And it's my opinion and the opinion of most of the fathers of the church that some of that had been um, manifest, however incompletely, by people like Plato, to a much lesser extent Aristotle, and then uh, the Neoplatonic school. Now, one of the central... Uh, concepts in the philosophy of, of, of John Scotus is that um, ultimately all created things will return to their source. And this comes straight out of Plotinus, that ultimately matter is something problematic. It's a heresy to say that matter is evil intrinsically. Matter is a problem in after the fall, of course, but that's not the same thing as saying that it's intrinsically evil. What's the natural state of being is pure freedom, but pure freedom is pure spirit. A corporeal thing, by definition, is not free. It's determined uh, simply by cause and effect. Corporeal things will return to their incorporeal causes. Matter, corporeal things, will be then reabsorbed into the forms first posited by Plato. These are logical, not temporal, but logical causes of material nature. And once matter is reabsorbed into spirit, time will then become timeless. Eternity exists, but eternity is not infinite duration of time. Eternity is a negation of time. Those are two very different things. There is no time in the realm of the Trinity, in the realm of the forms. There's only time in the realm of matter, and time exists because matter is, by its very structure, imperfect. Because it's imperfect, it is subject to cause and effect, it's subject to cause and effect because objects in nature are never fully actualized. There's always some potential left in them that needs to be worked out. Of course, in the formal world, in the world of the platonic forms or ideas, there is no potential left. They are pure actual. And this is something that's a part of God's mind and part of his universe. Paradise, to use a, uh, a, a, a to use a kind of a strange word, paradise is precisely this state. Man and the nature surrounding man will shed their in, their 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 corporeality and take on this new entity, this new entity of the pure relation 
the pure interpenetration between matter and spirit, that is the final end of all objects. It's not the negation of matter, it's the transformation of matter. We see this in the Eucharist at the liturgy, we see it in the sacraments, most of all we see it in the person of Christ where the human and divine natures existed unmixed but present in a single person who manifested them and balanced them perfectly. So, that being said, when we talk about the fall of man, that's probably one thing we all agree on, that, that man in nature is fallen and imperfect. There are always problems, things don't quite relate the way that they're supposed to. Um, the, the fall in metaphysical terms, according to Scotus, is that there was a descent of the mind from the world of formal realities to the world of material realities. And material realities manifest the formal realities, although only uh, imperfectly. Sin, imperfection, that is this gap between material chaos on the one hand and the form that's meant to control that on the other hand. If there's matter, then there must be form. If there's energy, there must be a formal flow, a movement of this energy. There's no getting away from the necessity of, of having a, a material world, however, however you want to define that, even in, in, in terms of energy, it really doesn't matter. And then it's formal cause in the sense that this cause, form, imposes itself on what otherwise would be the chaotic flow of energy. So, this means that the human mind, after the fall, is imprisoned in a human body, which, by its very nature, is forced to participate in the world of sense and materiality. What that means in terms of ethical behavior, moral behavior, is that the human being, an unredeemed human person, is dominated by passion. And that passion makes war against reason at all times. One thing about fallen man, non-redeemed man, is that they, is that the human reason is a slave to the passion. This means that passions, we're talking about uh, anger or envy or jealousy or greed or any of that stuff, food and drink, the fear of death, anxiety, all this stuff dominates the mind. The mind serves really as a way to work out the means and then the justification for the action. But the ends of our action are dictated by the passions. This is something where um, the ancient Orthodox uh, truth and the ancient Greek way of thinking were absolutely uh, one and the same. The intellect, because it is free, cannot be at home in the realm of material things. Because the intellect is free and can think and reason as it pleases, it must therefore be at home only in a spiritual realm. Remember, spirit is the same thing as freedom. Freedom is the very negation of corporeality or materiality, physical nature, cause and effect. Freedom, therefore, must be in the realm of the spirit, and the existence of freedom proves the existence of the realm of the spirit because freedom cannot be explained uh, by corporeal cause and effect that doesn't that wouldn't even make any sense because corporeal cause and effect can only cause other corporeal causes and effects it cannot cause something of a completely different nature and uh, the one thing that all the ancients with a few exceptions like the atomists 
uh, uh, agreed on was that freedom is something inherent to human beings. It is connected to reason, and therefore reason and freedom and will are the very negation of material blind cause and effect. Hence, the spiritual world absolutely exists, but that spiritual world can only be understood by the intellect. Now, where the will goes, is the will going to be connected to the intellect, or is it going to be connected to the passions? That's the difference. And yet, we realize that the human condition is that we really are motivated by passion, by greed, by anger, by these things that we barely have control over. And therefore, only grace can enlighten the intellect and the will such as to keep you on the straight and narrow. And yet our freedom, which is not affected by grace, it's perfected by grace. Our freedom is still a problem. It's a problem because we have the ability and we use it all the time to follow our material nature in the satisfaction of material things for the sake of pleasure or um, uh, out of boredom and look, we're looking for distractions or something along those lines even with grace our freedom is unaffected and therefore uh, our freedom can be used and is used for the commission of sin sin here as I've said before is this imperfection it's the gap between material reality and the form that is meant to shape and direct material reality or energy Man, therefore, is a mediator. And again, you see this in, in Plato. The mediator between the angelic nature and the material nature. It's a man is a battleground. He is a composite battleground of the material passions and the immaterial reason, which is free. It's free because it's immaterial. It's immaterial because it's free. But, outside of the manifestation of Logos in the flesh, that is Christ. Christ has always been with us in the functioning of nature, of course. But the problem is, prior to Christ's incarnation, and those who refuse to accept that kind of life, of struggle, the cross, as Christ called it, reason ends up really being always in second place. Reason is a way to work out the purposes of the passions. Grace and grace alone can illumine reason such as to make it dominant and to provide it with its final end, the realm of purely material things manifest by the Trinity, by the divine nature. Man was at one time created like God, but sin tarnished this, sin harmed this. Man is like God in the sense that man, prior to the fall, was had, had an infinite potential for development, infinite perfectibility. Prior to the fall, human nature was linked to the immaterial nature of the forms. The natural world was not a simple cause and effect that functioned blindly on its own. It listened to the orders of man, man, not in this fallen, greedy state that destroys nature with his technology, but seeking to dominate it and control it for his own profit, which is no different than magic, by the way. The human nature at that time linked with the forms, linked intrinsically with the logos, and created nature, looked and behaved completely different. The final, the final issue is Christ himself. Because material nature, natural cause and effect, was joined intrinsically with immaterial nature. That's the central theological concept of the ancient church. Both God and man are, are now incorporeal in the sense that Christ brought corporeal human nature tarnished and harmed and damaged into in a physical union, in a real union, 
with the divine nature. God is the source on one hand of grace and on the other hand the functioning of nature according to law. And they mirror one another. If there is law, there must be a lawgiver. And we're talking about a extremely complex community of lawful behaviors. One law depends on another, and that depends on another. That cannot be the product of mere blind development. We're not talking about individual objects in nature. We're talking about the relatedness of all objects and the complexity of how these energies are formed, quite literally formed, and directed. This means that when we look at natural functioning abstractly from the point of view of law and mathematics, we see grace present there. Grace is just another word for divine power, divine energy, which has brought this immensely complicated, a practical infinity of lawful relations to what otherwise would be a chaotic, formless mass. Therefore, grace, the power and energy of God, mirrors and is mirrored by nature as a lawful and mathematically expressible entity. And so it's my view, and it's the view of, of Scotus and so many others within the Platonist tradition, that real science is not contradicted by the Christian point of view. The modern scientific establishment is another matter. But the scientific establishment and science are two very, very different things. Plato was a mathematician, and so his concern was with the material realm of truth that is only imperfectly manifest in the way things function. But Scotus will go even further and say that both natural law, speaking generally as a collection of all natural laws, and God's energy as such, these are revelations. They're revelations to human reason, to the human mind. The limit of our mental capacity is manifest by the fall. This is the problem with the modern scientific establishment, or really the modern establishment in any academic discipline, is that their money and their political connections and their personal interests and their ideological interests are just as important as actual scientific experimentation. And if you know the academic world like I do, you realize how powerful this is. Science has been distorted, in fact, well, it's actually brought into existence by the state, by the nature of the maritime economy in Great Britain and the Netherlands at the end of the Renaissance. Modern scientific world was born connected to the British and Dutch state and its economy, especially as it eventually was manifest in the Royal Society uh, under, uh, at least formally under Charles II, and um, the Lunar Society. The Lunar Society was a more esoteric uh, scientific group in Great Britain, uh, which took into itself most of the industrial uh, and uh, mercantile elite of the country. The uh, Lunar Society also um, helped finance the French Revolution and all of these uh, kind of ideological movements throughout Europe. But what all that really means is that since mankind has fallen, what passes oftentimes for scientific truth is some real physical truth mixed with a lot of self-interest and distortion, economic, social, ideological, whatever it is. And that's something in any establishment, 
any bureaucratic establishment of any kind, you're going to have those kind of distortions, and it should be taken seriously. And you've got to make sure to make a, a, a very strong conceptual distinction between science and the scientific establishment, between ethics and professors of ethics in the universities. So, finally, I mean, you know, the, the ultimate goal of all of this is the final in interpenetration of all things into a singular, timeless unity of perfection. All things will find their way back to this perfection. God, nature, humanity, revelation, all of this taken together. And, and, and Scotus makes the claim that, you know, there's no Revelation is as much to be found in studying the natural world as it is with studying scripture or studying our own egos and psyches, and psychological makeup. Salvation is to be found in the connection of all of these things. And I think that Plato and Platonism long since rejected as a means of studying the natural world should be resurrected. And I think Plato and the Platonic vision is a better basis for the scientific uh, world than the present um, sort of neo-positivism that dominates now. Anyway, that's all for another time. Uh, this has been uh, Orthodox Ireland in the mind of John Dun Scotus. Excuse me, um, uh, John Scotus Irugina, uh, and uh, the Greek inheritance of early medieval Ireland and uh, the Orthodox tradition.